thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, uh, I'm very happy. I want to thank Greenfield Community College, of course, for uh, letting me here. I want to thank uh, uh, Judy Raper and, and Gary and my handler, uh, Luke Mattel. I want to thank my parole officer and the police program for letting me come out here tonight. Uh, since Tom Hanks said those words, I can't go down the street anymore. I just call the under the sun. Uh, you saw the scroll. I, I saw the scroll. I can't believe I did that. I can't remember two-thirds of these movies. Uh, and most of you weren't even born when half of these were uh, going on. Some of them made a million dollars. Some of them made a million dollars. And so does anybody have any questions about these movies? No? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I want to do something tonight. I, uh, truthfully, there's a story attached to every one of those. Some that I can tell, some that I can't tell. Uh, and tonight I'd like to just uh, pluck a few snippets of one or two things that happened to me. Uh, I want to certainly end the evening uh, talking about Angels in America and the incredible production uh, that uh, Tom Gee is going to put on here. And I, if you've never seen Angels in America, about that a little later. Um, not to be egotistical, <laughs> uh, but uh, again, going through these snippets and things, uh, hello, I never wanted to be in the movie business. I never thought about the movie business. Uh, I, I want to talk about three things in general tonight uh, it, it, that I think affect my life, certainly, and all of our lives. And this generation, uh, which to me, of course, I mean, I'm not telling you if you don't even know, uh, the generation to me basically is where we're born, our generation. Irish America, white, black, green, uh, 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 healthy, unhealthy, uh, but we are a slice, a sandwich in the progress of, 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 of life. Uh, my father was born in 1898. Uh, my mother was born in 1900. What? My father uh, was, made, became a horseshoer after the cavalry. The car came in. The radio came in. All right? You can think of their children. My brothers and sisters were born in the 20s. And that was a whole other thing. Then came the war. Right? And then I came. 14 years after my sister. And so I was a different generation. Uh, television came in when I was 10, and it's up you know how it goes. Gas was only in water, uh, and we had one car, and everybody. Uh, you, when you dialed the phone, you had to wait for the rotor to go back before you could touch the next one. <laughs> and we're all, you know, and it was a world for many of us that, that well, the, the younger generations, Gen X, Y, Z, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, uh, you know, each one of us has an experience that it, that's there. I mean, old guys like me are always going around saying, well, you know, I crawled naked to school. <laughs> and the next generation will do the same thing. So what I'd like to do, so that's generations. Environment, you know, we don't have a choice of where we're born. Uh, there it is, but the environment can be a lot of things, our environment. Uh, class, city, place, rich, poor, and our environment changes, life changes. And to me, the biggest of all are um, uh, mentors, or to use the current term, influencers. And influencers in our lives, you know, can be good, bad, you know, uh, but they change our lives. And an influencer can be a thing as well, you know, an event in our life, whether it's catastrophic or uh, winning the lottery and having the guy with the tattoos come around and, and show you new homes. Um, <laughs> so, what I'd like to do is tell you what happened to me, basically, before I get you behind the lens to see what happened. Because, again, I was of a generation and of a time where 
a Hollywood movie was something. My world was totally different. Uh, you know, so uh, I grew up in Pittsfield. Uh, one end of the street was the massive General Electric with a yellow smokestack. There was like a docile dragon during the day and at night threw soot all over my mother's laundry out in the backyard. On the other end was the Catholic Church, blue collar Catholic neighborhood. Uh, and everything, of course, without these things in my pocket, was external or board games. So, high school, happy day, everything was fine. And then back then, which is 1960, at the end of high school, people, uh, mainly uh, rich girls uh, who were in my class, my Catholic high school class, and rich people were people that had fireplaces. Uh, uh, we're saying, oh, well, you guys do the SATs. Where you, you know, where you going to apply to school? I'll make a long story short, uh, three of us finished high school. My parents got as far as eighth grade, through no fault of anybody's. But uh, I have no idea. What were the SATs? What are SATs? Uh, make a long story even longer. Uh, the first community college in the state of Massachusetts. This is the first influence. Uh, was starting Berkshire Community College in Pittsfield, uh, sharing a school with, uh, uh, with uh, secondary school kids, eighth graders, ninth graders. Didn't quite have the feel of college at first. Uh, and so, give me your lunch, kid. <laughs> so, what then went, so what happened was uh, I had my first influencer, who was the Dina woman who was a woman from the, a chain smoking woman from the Bronx, uh, who had a, a voice like grinding gravel. Uh, and she said to me, uh, what do you want? What do you want to do electrical technology for? <laughs> uh, 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 well, because I can get a job. Right? I do know that. Why don't you switch to liberal arts so they can go to another school and, I, and you can take a million choices that's the way you want for a job. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay. Now, how do I do that? I'll work it out for you. Went home and told my father I was going to take liberal arts. He said, what do you want to take painting for? <laughs> <laughs> you think about it. It was an honest joke, because I couldn't answer him. Well, I took the courses and, of course, fell in love with an education. A general, what I think colleges and schools should be for all of us, in a way, is a broad general education. So that we go out and talk and deal in the world. So anyway, there that went. I went to UMass, transferred to UMass. Uh, majored, believe it or not, in speech therapy. Uh, and just went along with my life. And then I want to tell you another snippet about where I meet the second influence. So I'm going to deal with the college life. Uh, matter of fact, I have some college friends here. Uh, one day, uh, some friends of mine said, hey, want to come in the Hearst, it was a rock and roll band, by the way, want to come in the Hearst, we're going we're to go to New York and we're going to be in a movie. <laughs> oh, sure, I got nothing to do, let's go be in the Hearst, and I drove to New York, and they were in a movie. Now, they weren't in, you have to remember this, I have to stop every once in a while to remind me and you. No such thing as GPS. There was no, you know, everything was a map. What I knew of New York City, having never been there, was there was Harlem, yes, there was Central Park, and there was Wall Street. I didn't even know it had five boroughs. So anyway, we arrived at this place, this warehouse, and they set up the band, and there's movie, a couple of guys. They don't look like my idea of what Hollywood movie guys would look like. And there's a lot of girls walking around like in their underwear. <laughs> I can't go on to the set while my buddies are in there. I sit down and spend the whole day, which was a long day, with a producer. The producer has a pompadour hairdo, gold chain, leather coat, and a stiletto strapped to his uh, boot. And we hit it off. And he gave us, I was going to make sure we hit it off. And he gave me his business card, which said Charles Carmelo, producer, New York with a phone number, Yugoslavia. 
with a bump. <laughs> well, that ended, we drive back, and I tell my friends, I said, you know you were in a portal. We were not. <laughs> we played music. I said, you know what I did, Tony? You were in a porno. <laughs> Life went on, all right? <laughs> uh, so I go to move to Spain uh, because my only mentor at UMass was the woman who taught me Spanish. I was attracted to her, I was also attracted to Spanish. And I said to her, I'm done with speech therapy, I have a full boat, full boat to graduate school. This one you could afford to put yourself through college. And I got a full boat to graduate school. And I'm working high-rise construction, building the 22-story dorms at UMass. And I'm starting to get afraid of heights. <laughs> uh, well, to be honest with you, I don't want to go. I don't want to do speech therapy. I, I don't want to sit on little tiny chairs with a little tiny table with, with kids. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I don't and she said, well, why don't you go to Spain? Uh, you can go to the, which was, turned out to be a junior year abroad. I didn't know about that. Uh, you can go to a university for like 50 bucks a semester, blah, blah. So I saved my money, got on a freighter, went to Spain, went to Granada, went to the university, and, well, you know, I was reading Hemingway at the time. So I went to Bullfights, drank a lot of wine. It was, it was another step in an education. Well, okay, well, the money ran out. And so what am I doing? So I come back on, here's another person, I want you to remember, on an Italian liner, the smallest boat, it was really, I think, a, 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 like a lake, one of those cruise on the lake things. This was small. They had a lounge singer, big woman, lounge singer. That's all I remember outside of throwing up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I come back, uh, I have friends who live uh, in Montague Center. Anybody know where Montague Center is? Montague, Montague Center? And this was during the Vietnam era, hippie days, blah, blah, blah. And so we lived together. Uh, we're doing experimental theater. One of the guys writing, you know, then this again, this is pretty exciting stuff. Uh, and I'm working three jobs. I'm a bartender at the Hotel Weldon, for those that know Greenfield, it was a hotel. Uh, I was uh, <coughs> teaching two days a week back at Berkshire Community College, thanks to my first influencer. And Life was going on, it was fine. Nothing up here, just living day to day, you know. Uh, not thinking about a real future. Oh, here it is. The phone rings. But you're you, doing your thing with the thing, the phone rings. On the other end, I pick it up, there's a guy, he says, you Mike Hill? I said, yes, I am. He says, uh, you want to work on our movie? Who's screwing around with me here? <laughs> what do you mean by a movie? Yeah, we're making a movie in Pittsfield, and we'd like you to work on it. Uh, you want to tell you you're free? The, the woman, the dean and woman at the college recommended you. Bam. Okay, well now here's my life going this way. Uh, sure. Well, well, how, 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 what, what do you do? <laughs> she says, come over. We're staying in Lebanon Valley, New York, in a motel. Uh, and I'll show you what to do. Okay, and I didn't ask about cellar or anything. Pack my army duffel bag. I go over to Lebanon Valley, New York, to this sleazy motel by the racetrack where the owner has a parrot on his shoulder all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I meet the producer of the movie. Now, this was a time in, in the movie world where people were breaking away into what we call independent film today was being made by different people. This was a a film about a true story of uh, a couple. One was a sleazy gigolo guy who would write older woman, uh, meet them, uh, date them, get engaged, get married, get written into the will, take the money and run. He did this a lot. He wrote, uh, the original name of the movie was Dear Martha. Uh, and he was writing to this nurse, and this nurse and he fall in love. And while they're in love and doing this now together, posing as brother and sister, because the sister has to come on the honeymoon, blah, 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 and they start killing off, rather than just leaving, they start killing off the people that he's dating. That's the movie. Um, I got there, I did, 
It was like being on methadone. <laughs> you know? I got there and they had me, yeah, I was a gopher, get the coffee, okay. Uh, make, make this, build, build this thing here. Uh, there were three people, by the way. There was a cameraman, a director, a young guy out of film school, a cameraman, uh, and a gaffer. Everybody, anybody want to know what a gaffer is or knows what a gaffer is? Everybody knows what a gaffer is, right? Okay. Was Head electrician. And he used to use a gaffing stick that they used to use to move the lights. There it is. Who shows up with a couple of light bulbs? He's from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, a couple of light This was low budget. I hired all the assistants. My entire family was in this movie. My <laughs> father on a bus. Uh, 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 my sister got uh, rolled into a, a grave. <laughs> and all my friends were there. They stay, anything. And I am thrilled. Every day, the blood is pumping. And so two weeks into it, oh, by the way, that was my first acting role. Uh, and I played opposite uh, the producer's wife uh, and the nurse uh, that I told you about. Uh, I'll show you the clip in a minute. The woman who's playing the nurse, I find out, is the woman who was the lounge singer on the Italian band <laughs> of back. She later became, uh, for anybody who saw the movie Seven Beauties, Lena Burke-Muller's movie, Seven Beauties, she was the dominatrix. <laughs> for those that know what dominatrix, of course she did. <laughs> so, so uh, we're into our second week of shooting, right? I had just finished almost drowning because we were doing a drowning scene where we, at, at the local lake in Pittsville, where we're, my, Shirley was her real name, where Shirley announced to us that she couldn't swim. She was Zoftig, very, very Zoftig. So I came up with a bright idea. You know, because she could go out to the shallow water up here, and the director saying, "No, no, no! I can see, I can see." So I volunteered to put on a mask and brace her from underneath <laughs> while the camera rolled. You know, just long enough for her to go under a little and come back up. I had one shot. I almost died. I, mean, <laughs> I was driven into the mud. I'm under there in the mud, and I can't. You know, the director is going, it's going, it's going. Mike, how old were you at the time? Huh? How old were you? 23. <laughs> so, anyway, the day ends, it's another day at, the, at night, and I find out from the producer that they fired the director. <laughs> fired the director that day for zooming in on a beer can or something or whatever. It wasn't because I drowned almost, oh no. <laughs> so I, I feel bad, and so I uh, uh, asked Moby, that was the guy, who ran the hotel, who took the same name as his parrot. <laughs> I said, Moby, where's this guy? He says, he's packing in his room, leaving. I said, and so I knock on his room, I go to his room, and I said, ah, gee, I, you know, I, we didn't really meet. I, 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 I don't know anything about what happened to you, but I'm really, really sorry. By the way, uh, uh, my name's Mike Haley. Uh, uh, best of luck. And he says, oh, mine's Marty Scorsese. Thanks for <laughs> The next time I saw Harry Scorsese, I was interviewing for the movie Taxi Driver at the Plaza Hotel. And I said, well, geez, we didn't do too bad, did we? <laughs> <laughs> the movie ended, like all movies, like a theater piece. But last night, the last performance, that last bow, that all of a sudden you go, whoa, it's me again, whoever I am. It's over. The adrenaline is sinking. Uh, and for me, without any, you know, I'd save a little money on that. Uh, uh, what am I going to do? I, I'm not going back to the commune. I, I can't go back. I didn't know. Not a clue. So the producer says to me, he says, by the way, uh, it's too bad uh, you're not living in New York because I, I need somebody for my television show. Uh, we start up in about three weeks. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> this is the man who has never been to New York. Funny. Uh, well, I'm free. Really? You want to come and work on my television show? And again, I'm so stupid. I'm not asking any questions. About you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Uh, uh, give me your number. You call me in about two weeks and let me know what's going on. Right. Hey, thanks. Everybody leaves. 
I'm there with Moby and Moby. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, when I was in Spain, this is another influencer, in Granada, I met an el elderly couple, somebody who looks like me now, and they were touring Spain, and I helped them go around and see, hey, here's this. Spent a week with them, and we became pen pals after uh, Spain. And so when the Moby, Moby thing, when, when Honeymoon Killers was over, I wrote to them and called them, and they were at their summer house in Connecticut, and they said, well, geez, we're going to be traveling for three months. Why don't you stay for free in our apartment in Brooklyn? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, let me get the map out. <laughs> it was a place, that, if you know New York, which I'm sure most of you do, it was not just Brooklyn, it was Brooklyn Heights. Wow. You know, living room, dining room, full kitchen, den, Bob Bob Moran. Uh, and they give you the instructions. So before, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of myself just a little bit. Before I leave for New York, I want to show you the opening scene to uh, Honeymoon Killers. My first acting performance was Shirley Stroller, the producer's wife, where I have, which I invented, a maiden explosion at Pittsfield General Hospital. <laughs> and she comes in to uh, chastise us. Uh, and please, I, I want a show of cards after from one to ten. <laughs> I'm in the apartment having a great time. The television show, raise a hand if you know what it was, you won't see my go up, uh, called The Firing Line. Oh, two, uh, two people, three people remember the fire line. William F. Buckley Jr. Yes. 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 Right. And not to be political one way or another, but he was a very big, it was a very big Republican show, and, and he's a guy who talked uh, like a rabbit with a cork up its throat. <laughs> very intellectual. The best thing I remember about the show is I had to find audiences for it, by the way. <laughs> and what I did every spare minute I had, I was getting $60 a week, um, was go around with my map, ride a subway every part of New York. I got to know New York like crazy. Uh, but the couple was coming back. So what am I going to do? One day I'm going out the door to get the laundry done. And I look around the corner, and there are three people. They, they are, there are three people. <laughs> way ahead of ourselves here. I'm sorry. <laughs> not sorry or not. Uh, there, there are three people waiting on a brownstone steps, and a little sign at the door. And I knew instantly because now I'm a New Yorker, because I can ride the subway anywhere and not look up for my book until my stop's there. <laughs> so anyway, I, I go, I, I saw a detective movie. I go as if I lived there through the front door, hit every button, and I hear a voice on the other end. Yeah, come on up. This man turned out to be the owner of the building, a man named Elias Feinside, you can't make that up, <laughs> who sat behind the desk in his apartment, and he looked like a freshly hatched eagle, bald, <laughs> and giant ears, and, and a suit like David Byrne wear, you know, and stopped making sense, giant, swimming. I had to look down his shirt to find his head. <laughs> anyway, I got the apartment, and it was going to be, pardon me, young students and people, in Brooklyn Heights, New York, $170 a month, which included utilities. One room, a shared, she said, you don't mind, Haley, sharing the bathroom with a Norwegian woman, do you? <laughs> anyway, I did. <laughs> I landed the airplane or our day. Uh, Anyway, so now I had an apartment, but I needed more money. $60 a show, I was going to the, this place on Broadway, uh, uh, 79 cents for spaghetti, had steaks, where you get a steak, a baked potato, for $1.29. Uh, but I was the 79 cent spaghetti guy for a long time. My apartment now had a cot, a phone, 
a Rolodex, which was empty, uh, a lamp or two, and a couple pans. Uh, but I was very happy. Uh, so I said, I need more money. He says, no. I said, uh, well, uh, I, I'm going to have to quit. He says, you quit me, this is the producer and the William F. Buckley show. You quit me, you'll never work in, I'm serious, you'll never work in this town again. Now, I had made a vow when I went to New York that if I had to do a job that I could do anywhere else, why the hell am I sitting around in this town doing something? I quit, all right? I had enough to make for the next month's rent. I'm trying to figure out what to do. I'm, I'm going to a lab to leave film off for a friend of mine, and I bumped into a guy coming out. Sorry, I'm so... Charlie Carmelo. <laughs> New York, Yugoslavia. Hey, you, yeah, you're the kid Mike, whatever you do. And tell him my whole story, my long, long story. Peels off a hundred bucks, gives it to me. He says, uh, give me your number, where you live. You got my card? I said, I, I long misplaced it. <laughs> says, Here's my card, said the same thing. He said, I'll give you a call. So I'm back in my apartment in New York, and one night the phone rings. I'll be there in 25 minutes. <laughs> okay. Outside, Lincoln Continental, in the car with Charlie, drive off, talk for a while. I, I'm not asking, I'm not asking questions. Uh, we're in Brooklyn at a warehouse. There's a truck, there's a couple other guys, and I'm helping them unload racks of clothing. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of days later, a phone call from Charlie. I come down during the day. We drive up 6th Avenue, stop just before 47th Street. He's reaching the back. Will you, Mikey? I pull out the shopping bag. I can hardly lift. He said, oh, give it to me. He said, I'm going to walk around the corner. Uh, I mean, you drive around. Keep driving around the block. But if I ain't here back in 25 minutes, here's where you go with a car in Brooklyn. Just tell the guy. It was melted gold. <laughs> I worked for Charlie, then one day, finally, he says to me, uh, and he peels off the money as usual, but I'm looking for a job all the time. In New York, in the movie business, uh, unless you belong to the union, you aren't getting a job. It was a father and son thing. These union guys started with Biograph Studios with D.W. Griffin. You couldn't get into the union for love and no money. Fine. So Charlie gives me another job. Hey, come over to the... And I'm, all of a sudden, I go into the studio on 55th Street, and there are those people again in their underwear and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm, I'm working on pornos. Now, you see more skin in Teletubbies than I saw in those pornos. That was before, it was before, well, it was before the kind of stuff you can see on TV now. Uh, so I cooked. I loaded magazines. I was taught how to hang lights. I watched the cameraman. I learned a lot. Uh, but still, looking for a job, looking for a job. One day, Charlie says to me, and this is the influencer again, I have a friend who's going to make a movie in Mississippi. This is my first real movie. Uh, why don't you get on it? You can be the, sort of the production guy. You know, I didn't know. I knew titles by then, which I'll explain to you in a minute. Uh, I met the guy, the producer, a man named Paul Roebling, uh, of the family that built the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and they were putting the movie, uh, uh, a small movie together uh, that uh, uh, Faulkner, was it Faulkner? Yeah, Faulkner story uh, that they had put together that they were going to shoot in Mississippi about, uh, in the 20s, of a poor Mississippi guy who takes in this abandoned woman and, and nurses her back to help, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I have the job, and get the map out, Mississippi, uh, uh, Tupelo, Mississippi, and uh, so it was the first time anybody paid money to fly me somewhere. They were going to give me four hundred and twenty-five dollars a week, all right, for, as sort of the production manager. What I had done just before this movie was the Directors Guild of America which takes in directors, all directors, it's the union, directors, production managers, assistant directors, location managers, and associate directors in, in uh, theater, uh, was having his first training program test 
I took it. They picked 10 of us out of 2,000. Just as I go to go to Mississippi, I become the trainee for $70 a week on the same movie I'm going to go down and set up. <laughs> but now I was going to make a living. So I, so I go down to Mississippi, and there are two things I have to find. Uh, one is I have to find a something that could work for 1920s rural Mississippi general store. The other is a courthouse where they can shoot. Again, it's low budget. The main actor is Robert Duvall. He had just mm. finished Godfather. I come down to Mississippi now. Uh, they're going to rent me a car. I'm going to rent my own Lincoln. I have a car now. <laughs> and one of my first nights there, I just out socializing in the bar. And Oh, by the way, four years before that, four civil rights workers were killed. Uh, I see all the signs in Mississippi, the separate entrances. I see everyone is very nice and polite and white. And I don't want to cast big aspersions, but underneath there's something else going on. When I drove into Tupelo for the first time and the place smelled like, uh, there was an abattoir, so it smelled like raw pork the whole town. Uh, anyway, I'm at the motel, uh, and one night I decided to go out and just mingle with the folks. I'm sitting in the bar, and there's about six people, uh, three guys and three girls, uh, college age, sitting at the table next to me uh, in there, and they say, hey, all right, come on over and join us, won't you? All right, so I go over and join, and we all have drinks, things like that. Hey, you ever have catfish hush puppies? <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> but we're going to get some catfish and ice puppies. Want to come with us? Uh, sure, sure. <laughs> My car's out. But no, no, you come, in, you come with us. All right. <laughs> we drive in the dark night of Mississippi. And we drive, and we drive. And I'm looking at my watch, and they're all laughing and having a grand old time. And all of a sudden, we turn off that road through the sort of puddles and rickety bridges, and we're in the woods, and we come to this peninsula. And on the right, there's a building that's made of cinder blocks, just cinder blocks. One door. Outside are barrels, and barrels filled with oil for cooking and hush puppies. And you go in, we all go in, and, and I'm still checking my watch. We all go in. And, uh, the woman that has a desk. There's another room with a jukebox, and the jukebox is up on a platform off the floor because the people dancing in there, the floor keeps going like this. So <laughs> the jukebox keeps playing. We get room number seven. We go down to this room. It's, a, it's an empty room with a table and chairs. Ring the buzzer. Waitress comes in, order plates of catfish, hush puppies, you know, and they're, they're pulling out their Jack Daniels and stuff like that. And I'm still looking at my watch. <laughs> and so we start talking, have a good time, eating hush puppies and catfish. And then I say, well, so uh, let me see, you're Frank, uh, you're Jerry, and uh, you're Ralph. No, Ralph. What? Ralph. Ralph? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ralph. How do you spell that? R A U U L. Ralph. <laughs> okay, Ralph, fine. Hey, listen to me. Mike, Mike, I'll tell you a joke. Oh, Ralph, tell Mike that joke. Tell Mike, Mike. everybody, you've been, you've been through this in your life. Oh, this is funny. This is so funny, Mike. This is such a great joke. You, go ahead, Ralph. Okay, okay, go ahead, Ralph. All right, Mike. The two guys go out, right? And they drive around. They meet this other guy, that's his name. And he comes up and play the other thing with the guy, and they all step out. And they're all busted up, bust. <laughs> and sitting there like this. Right. That's right, Yankee. You don't like our humor? Ooh. <laughs> that was really, I'm just stunned. I can't, I can't laugh. <laughs> anyway, that ended. I drove one day out of, in my air-conditioned Lincoln, along the flat uh, levee, the, the, on both sides, flooded uh, cotton fields. And I drove past shacks. This is 1968. 
shacks with the refrigerator on the porch and the people on the porch and the little crosses by the road with the, with the cans, with the flowers in them. And I just went on forever and ever and I took one county road nine county and my map, I, useless. And my gas tank's going like this. And for some reason off the county road, I saw one of those roads. I turned the corner, I'm going down this two lane path. Moss, covered, you know, and it's going on, I'm going through puddles, it's getting, it's okay, I got my Lincoln, you know, and I got my air conditioning, but I don't have much gas. And I come out in this spot, and on my right is a tree with a hen turkeys in it. And outside there's a woman bent over and she's got a, a bonnet on there, back is to me. And on the side here is a house, a white house. And the, and the, and the dirt road, which this turned out to be a driveway, the dirt road goes that way and right in front of me with one of those old worn gas pumps with a glass top <laughs> on it and a door and a, a, a raised porch and a sign faded says Shanless General and a big padlock on the door. Well, I get out of that car. Hey, ma'am, how you doing? How you doing? And this woman now has her back to me. She's got a machete. <laughs> She's swinging the machete like crazy, uh, chopping out uh, whatever the hell she was chopping out. And she turns to me and she like this, and this is like, felt like psycho at this time. <laughs> she turns to me, she's got these very bottom, bottom glasses, she's partly blind. And she, she sees me, but she, you know, she's walking, she doesn't know me from, you know, I'm, I'm a blur. And I'm backing up, backing up to the Lincoln, and, and then finally I hear from the, from the porch, Mama, it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Her name isn't Rob, is it? <laughs> Out comes this guy in coveralls, gravelly voice. Bryce Chomper, his mother goes in the house. I explain who I am, making a movie, he's looking to Lincoln over. You know, and I said, oh, okay, I gotta do the best I can to uh, negotiate with Bryce. I said, uh, what about the store? I said, yeah, what about it? I said, is that the general store? Yeah, it was the general store, my dad is the general store. Oh, uh, well, yeah, he, he died, died in the 30s. My mother locked it up. What do you mean she locked up? You mean he, she emptied it and locked it? No, she locked it up. You mean inside that store? Everything just the way it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bryce. Um, <laughs> uh, and I told him the story how we'd like to see. I'd like to see inside the store. Well, uh, Bryce goes down to the hall. Starts, you know, how people do with a stick in the. As they talk, <laughs> piddle with a stick. Some people will Bryce piddle in the drive with a stick. So I figured, if we're going to talk business, I'll talk business with Bryce. <laughs> <laughs> I get down and I fall on my ass. <laughs> Try to make it look very. Yeah. I decided, <laughs> like I decided to. Uh, <laughs> I don't have the stick brush, but uh, I can do it with my foot. <laughs> anyway, and I look at the driveway. He reaches in his pocket and he takes out a tin of Prince Albert tobacco, which is pipe tobacco, and he starts rolling a cigarette. You smoke, I don't smoke. <laughs> you should stop, Bryce. I hear your voice. <laughs> the whole driveway was plaster coated with Prince Albert tins. <laughs> this may take a while. <laughs> and again, of course, they were sticking to me. He says, well, hey, you want to see uh, our place? No, no, no. I take a drive in your car. Okay. Here we go again. <laughs> Get in the Lincoln, start driving. We must have drove 20, 15, 20 minutes. Down here, take a left, take a left, Mark. It's Mike. Mark. <laughs> take a left. Come back to the house. I says, geez, that's quite a drive. Is that all you're in? Yeah. Yeah, 950 acres. <laughs> uh, what, what do you do with it? Ah, oh, we get paid not to grow anything. <laughs> <laughs>
Not a government. And I always figure this, Mike. A lot more people ain't gonna be any more land. So he goes in and gets his mother. She comes out, he talks to her, she comes out. We go up to the general's door, she opens it, opens the door. Cans of whole nutmeg, nutmeg, cheese wheel, an ornate old cash register, uh, sacks of stuff, all piled up. I mean, you know, it's, I'm trembling. Uh, <laughs> so we made a deal. Now I'm going to show you a clip of Robert Duvall in the movie. Mm -hmm. I am going to show you that clip. Robert Which one is it? Huh? Which one is it? It's tomorrow. Black on it. Um, and where he goes to buy something in the store, you'll see a woman in the store seated down. That's Ma Shambly, my buddy Ma Shambly. Oh. So here's the store. We hardly touched a thing. <coughs> I finished the job in Mississippi as the trainee. Everybody was happy, and again, that adrenaline rush went away. But now I had a union. I had pension, I was going to get pension. And at the end of the thing, I woke up, and there was an envelope left for me by the producer with uh, $1,000. Not bad. Uh, I went off, and then came my next, in the, and I won't spend too much longer. I'm, I'm, I'm way behind myself, I hope you don't mind. Uh, the next producer was uh, Mike Nichols. Uh, I, I, like other people who went to the movies as a kid, uh, I, I could maybe tell you the name of the movies even as an adult, but mostly I could tell you who was in it, whether it was good or bad. I could never tell you who the director was. I had no idea who Mike Nichols really was until they said, did you see The Graduate? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's him, yeah. So. I'm flown now, first class, down to uh, Coconut Grove in Miami. At the time, the, the Miami Dolphins were raining. And I get to Coconut Grove, this boutique beautiful hotel. I go to my room, welcome basket, champagne. Oh, I mean, I, I'm, uh, by the way, I forgot. May I stop for a second and explain to you what ADs and, and trainees are? To become an assistant director or a production manager, you start as a trainee for two or more years, working on every kind of film with anybody possible. Then you become a second AD. Every movie has one or more. The second AD, in the shortest way, turns takes care of paperwork, setting the background, because there's no other business in the world where you come into a reality, hey, out! and bring in your own reality when it looks like the reality you got rid of. <laughs> Second AD does the paperwork, uh, gets actors from here to there, uh, and sets the background. The first assistant, then, you, then after so many years, you become a first assistant director. Uh, you're hired by the director, usually. Uh, as the first assistant director, you schedule the movie. Uh, the, the best comparison is, uh, you're the shop foreman. Uh, you schedule the movie, make sure you make the movie, you put all the elements into it with the director and other people, and you make sure that the day every day is run on time. That's a very simple way about that job. Um, so anyway, I'm a trainee, which I really do is becoming the second. I'm a trainee and I'm being flown down to my end. <coughs> and uh, I meet this guy. At, uh, in Miami, uh, that Mike Nichols is going to come, but not for a while. Uh, I want you to uh, uh, set everything up in the hotel, get the rooms ready. And by the way, we're doing this out, the movie's being filmed out on an island, Great Abaco, which is the size of, uh, of uh, Cape Cod, really. There's two things on Great Abaco. One is Marsh Harbor, and at the other end is well, where we stayed, which was a resort, which was more of a blueprint than a real place. He leaves me in Miami to uh, set up the rooms for everybody and everything else, which I do. And so everybody's starting to come in. It's all okay. Uh, one day, the Sunday before, remember I told you the dolphins were a big deal? Well, the bar at this hotel uh, was divided with a wall. 
And I come down one day, and the owner of the bar, the hotel, is blasting the wall out with a sledgehammer uh, because, as he says, I can't get enough people three deep in the bar to watch the Miami Dolphins. Okay? Ah, okay. So, this guy's okay. Everybody's in except for George C. Scott and his new wife. Now, every, Mike Nichols was scared to death of George C. Scott, and I have to tell you that even other people were too. But I've got his room set for him and his brand new wife, Trish, and it's all gonna be okay, and he, his agent calls and says, don't anybody wait up for us, we're gonna get in late, it's all gonna be fine, okay? I'll go through my checklist. <sighs> <laughs> Ring, ring, I pick up the phone. Noise, crash, bang, slam. Harry? Yeah. This is Jane Daisy, George C. Scott's agent. You better get your ass down here right now. Okay, and I hear screaming in the background. I hang it up. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get up. I'm up now. <laughs> Walking towards the door opening the door, yes. I'm leaving my room and I'm going downstairs. <laughs> I'm going to take the elevator, get on the elevator, and while the elevator's coming down to the lobby, I'm looking at the poster for their steaks. <sighs> Boy, I have to go for a steak right now. The door's open. <laughs> the door's open and there across from me is George C. Scott and his wife, Trish, and next to me, flattened against the wall, is the owner of the hotel with a lamp in his hand. <laughs> There's already busted vases, turned over table, and on the other side, with George and Trish, are two German shepherds called Gog and Magog. <laughs> they are drooling and growling and on choke chains. And George is saying, I'm going to let him go. Because only George Scott can say, I'm going to let him go. And the owner's going, you let him go. I start with this lamp and I'm going to pull a gun. Say, Excuse me, Frank. Um, I'm so stoked. Frank, uh, uh, put the lamp down, put the lamp down. Anyway, to make a long story short, I wake up. It's the next day. I get a phone call. It's George's agent, Jane Gacy. Thank you so much. You were brilliant. Whatever you did to stop this wasn't <laughs> The last piece I'll tell you, and then we'll get on to better things. Uh, so we go out to the island we're shooting at the island. We're staying at our boutique hotel. We carved out of jungle. We had six dolphins, right? And with another thing is the assistant director. All right, six dolphins, what do dolphins do? What do dolphins eat? Oh, they eat 35 pounds each of, of mackerel a day. 35 pounds of mackerel a day times six dolphins times six months shooting. Seven days, really, because they're going to eat on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and where do they get the mackerel? The mackerel oh, has to come from where? In New England, really? That, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, well, wait a minute. We're in the middle of the note. What? We're going to build a warehouse freezer? Okay. We'll build a warehouse. Why do we get George? Mike Nichols wants to bring his gourmet chef, and so we need another freezer for him in the kitchen. It went on, it went on, it went on. The first day of shooting comes. Mike's nervous, everybody's sort of heat up. Our, where we're staying in our blueprint hotel is a good 20 miles away on a, on a, uh, a limestone road that whenever it rained made potholes that, that make this area look like nothing at all. Uh, George has his Cadillac brought over to the island, and his driver and his two bodyguards, along with, of course, Gaga Maga and his wife Trish. We've started a very simple scene for day one. Mike, let's start simple. It's a scene where Trish goes into the cabin and she uh, sort of relaxes and lays down while George just does some dialogue about the dolphins with her. All right, first of okay. all, George is due here in 10 minutes. Where's George? We can't communicate. It's 35 miles down the road. Um, oh, wait, here comes the car. Here comes the Cadillac. 
driver gets out, opens the door, closes it, opens the back door, the two German shepherds get out, closes it. <laughs> did, you, did you shut them in the car? No, they're not in the car. Where are they? Oh, they're having a little argument. They're about 15 miles back down the road. <laughs> you know, newlyweds. Still get them. I'm going back for them in a little bit. He goes back for them. So uh, they come back and they get a wardrobe make up here. They do to get ready for the scene. Uh, and you can show the scene now. The first part with Trish. <clears throat> Uh, they finally come in, they get ready, they're ready, introduced to Mike, introduced to everybody. And so we're waiting to shoot the scene, and Mike Nichols comes out of the, the, the house and he goes, what are we going to do? And, and, and the editor's going, I don't know, no. get the cameraman, the cameraman, come here. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then all of a sudden I said, what, what's going on? What's going on? He said, you No. Well, I saw her, maybe she came in. She hasn't shaved under her armpits, and she's laying on the bed like this. <laughs> what the heck are we going to do? They shoot her like that. I, you know, the, his editor says, well, just tell George, what are you, crazy? <laughs> Make a long story short, George uh, took her aside. What's that? You know, don't shave your armpits. What's the big deal? That was it. Um, I'm well behind schedule. Uh, so what I would like to do if we can, um, I want to tell you a couple of quick stories uh, about the three most important people in my career, which were uh, Mike Nichols, of course, I did uh, 13 movies for Mike. Uh, we became, so we didn't have to really communicate with each other. He never looked at the schedule. I made the schedule and things like that. Uh, and I automatically took movies for him. And so he, he would call and say, we're doing this movie. Uh, fine. I, the one time I uh, I called Mike and I said, I've been offered a movie, Mike, uh, do you have anything? Do you have anything coming up? I said, no, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. The call was from Barbara Streisand to me and Sunderland, Babs. Uh, uh, we're doing a thing called Prince of Tides, do you want to do it? I said, well, can I think about it for a day? And then, then I called Mike and said, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And so we we're going to go scout down south. Uh, Plane ticket, they sent me plane tickets, I meet everybody. Day before I leave, the phone rings, it's Mike Nichols. I got a movie. <laughs> um, I, I, just said, I just took that, and he said to me, who would you rather have mad at me? You, me or Barbara Streisand? <laughs> I had to call Babs back and say I'm not taking the movie. I mean, it's like one of those moments that was just terrible. Uh, uh, but, um, Anyway, so I take a look at this one. Um, can you hear me back? All right. Mike uh, had a failure uh, some time ago. Tony, how many, look, raise your hand, how many people have seen Angels of America either on television or live? But better yet, how many people have never seen them? All right, I, there's no way that I can describe it outside of it. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning film that, that I urge you, I urge you to go see it. It's political, it's <clears throat> humankind, it, it deals with almost every kind of human problem in the world, <coughs> written by Tony Kushner. Uh, so anyway, uh, nobody would touch this uh, in terms of making it. And back then, um, the uh, television would not, uh, a movie star would not do television. You couldn't get a movie started in television. So when HBO got Mike and Emma Thompson and, and uh, um, uh, Meryl Streep and Al Pacino, uh, we're gonna go. The difference is this. In, in theater, when you see a play, it's like me looking at you and you looking at me. You can, because it's a proscenium. If you don't want to look at me, uh, you can look over there. You can look at your shoe. You can look anywhere you want. You have the range thing. You can look at that person in front of you. And when I'm doing something dramatic, if it doesn't really work for you, you may be in back and you can't see me like this. In film, you can't do that. You direct everybody's vision. 
when you deal with fantasy like we do in Angels in America, uh, you can't, when you do the play, it's an abstract. You can do it a, a sketch of, uh, you know, whatever you want. You don't need a full set, you need a door or something. And people can get into the rhythm of that empathy. When you do a movie, you can't do it that way. So anyway, I get the script, and, and uh, what happens in, in series, six hours. What happens in series television when it's six hours, what you get is they can shoot a one-hour special in 15 days. And what happens is you have a whole other crew and a whole other director leapfrogging to set up the next episode. So that somebody's prepping or somebody's shooting. Right? They prep and shoot, prep and shoot, prep and shoot. So you're only dealing with an hour, 15 days worth of work. Angels of America with Paris Troika uh, took us 183 days to shoot. Mm -hmm. That by and we shot six television episodes as one movie with one director and one cast. Uh, and I, I won't go into details because I just want to show you uh, one particular part of the movie that meant so much to me. And then we'll conclude. Um, so I get a script as the assistant director. My brother looks at it. Uh, and I make the schedule. I talk to all the departments and everybody else. First of all, the cast was locked in. They all went nuts saying, a year? You know? Well, you know so and, and they're like, Chino, I'm giving you six weeks in April and May. And that's it. That's to shoot all the scenes from all the episodes. We were going nuts. Everybody was going crazy. So I read this passage in the script that says, the angel comes right through the roof into, into Pryor's room. The angel from heaven. How many people raise your hand have seen an angel in any movie flying? You have not. <laughs> what movie? This one. This one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, love you. Uh, <laughs> It, it, and I'm looking at it and I'm going, oh, wait a minute. The angel comes through the ceiling of his roof, of his room. Friar's dying of AIDS. Uh, he's fantasizing, maybe. Uh, and, and so he's a prophet about the future. That's, it's an oversimplification of something that Tom uh, will give us a better explanation someday. With. Uh, but I'm looking at it as the assistant director. I'm saying, well, wait a minute. Yes, we can get the wires up. This is before digital, by the way. We're using film. Today, digital, you can do anything, anywhere you want. Uh, you know, you have somebody stand here, they'll be flying in here. Couldn't do it. Well, Angel comes through the roof of the stage, has to hover and talk, and it, it has to stay in focus even though it moves. And if, if it comes through one hole, it can't move forward or backward. What do we do? Well, Mike, what do we do? Well, he does not like to be dumb. Here's what you do. You get bird books. Give me books on every bird there is. And I want to see the wings. I want to see the wings on birds, which was true. This angel has three different sets of wings, right? So we find, finally find, you know what? Call the Victoria's Secret people. <laughs> so we get the Victoria's Secret people, and we get their, all the people that make their wings. Okay, so we, we show Mike, and this takes months. Meanwhile, we're shooting, by the way. And the schedule's getting closer to the point where the angel is going to come through the ceiling, okay? Uh, what the heck? All right, and so we're shooting, and in between we're saying, uh, okay, here's wings, we've got people making wings for a long way. Uh, what did the in wings weigh? Well, each weigh about 20, 25 pounds. Uh, uh, okay. Um, well, before we saw that, how do we get her through the ceiling? We had to redesign the set. There was not a hole in the ceiling. There was no ceiling. And if you look, there's no apartment up above it. So she doesn't come through the ceiling. She comes through the ceiling, through the apartment up above, and well, now she's here. But how do we get her here and have her hit a mark in the air, our angel? I mean, while they're working on the wardrobe in the lens, right? Um, well, oh, the only people that can come up with this are the people that do the camera for all the sporting events. You know, the computerized camera that follows you around and you're down there? They're in California. They come out, okay, tear the set apart, put up I-beams, grid it, we'll program it, we'll put the wires up, 
free of practice, practice and everything, we can stop on a dime. Okay, uh, my, oh, Emma, hi. You're gonna be in the yeah. Uh, you did read my contract. Uh, didn't really what? Uh, you know I have a bad back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is it moving on? Yes, uh, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, we'll take care of it. So I, everybody gets together and we start talking about what the hell we do. The wardrobe is ready, the wings are ready, they're working on the cable with a stunt person for the different stops and ups and downs. Um, and the days are getting closer. Uh, well, uh, the stunt man comes up with a bent wire with a bicycle seat on it that is, has wires that we'll get rid of and where she has one foot can extend below the other because otherwise she's hanging here like this. By the way, in the play, when they've tried to fly different angels, uh, some of it were, and Tony Kushner wrote, he says, do not, if, it, if I wrote anything bad in my life, was putting the angel flying in. Uh, and, and one line of performance is the angel comes out flying, flips upside down, <laughs> and the dress goes over her head. <laughs> and another, another one when the angel comes out and comes to do the dialogue like this, uh, it turns and she's going to land like this. Uh, in one line of performance where an angel came out, uh, it, it came out and, and there were a bunch of uh, uh, American uh, like film uh, or theater buffs that would come to London to see it. And one buddy wrote to, to the director saying, wasn't that magical how the angel came over our heads and threw off her wig, I know what that meant, and went flying right into the balcony. <laughs> so, this was another problem. Alright, so now what do we got? We got wardrobe, wings, Emma with a back problem but a seat to sit on, but we still have to put the wings on her and they have to move. Way out in Brooklyn, a little machine shop and a little guy like he must be Geppetto. You, know, <laughs> you see what I made here? Look at this. One of those guys, Gyro Gear Loose, uh, he made for us a lightweight aluminum, um, compact thing with uh, uh, holes on each side that would fit the wings and gears inside that ran with cables that would run down the back of her outfit that ran out to a little cart that he sat on like this with two levers <laughs> and, and he, the levers went like this and the wings went like that <laughs> okay so now we've got all that and uh, we're going to now we're really really getting close and I'm getting a lot and this cameraman's getting a lot of flack Mike you know, how's it going? Because we had the stunt woman working after hours with us to get range and focus and things like that, and we had a lot of problems with that. And we hadn't put Emma up in the stirrups yet, so we put her up in the stirrups, put the thing on her. Uh, another set of cables takes the weight off of her backpack. The bicycle seat's helping the weight off of her back. All right? And then Mike says, um, this is on a couple of days before we did the whole thing, which she tested, okay. He says, I want wind on her. <laughs> and only her. <laughs> no matter who's around, I want wind on Emma. And uh, she wound up with an eye infection from this. Uh, we had tears, tears of guys with fans, uh, just out of frame, everywhere. And you had to, again, cut the frame whenever she came in contact uh, with whoever it is. The day is coming. For three days, we, for three days we shot the effects of what happens in the set. Uh, everything. When we shot this, it was like, uh, and I, I hate to use this analogy, but it was like the flag raising on Iwo Jima. There were tears, literally. Not me. <laughs> Mike Nichols was in tears. Uh, the, the camera, all of us were high-fiving when the shot was over. So I want to end my little talk by showing you the prelude and the approach of the angel.
I'm sorry to have jumped all over it. I know it's all about moi and how I got to that with those people. But, you know, yeah, for a kid in the commune or, you know, from Pittsfield, all of the influences of my life uh, have been there. Yeah. And, and that includes, by the way, my wife and, and the friends and people I have here in, in Conway. And, and I hope that, uh, you know, we all can tell our own stories to each other and think back a little bit about what made us where we are and what we did. Thank you. I'll open up for questions and answers uh, uh, if there are any. Anything but except the early pornography. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking at this spot. Uh, and again, each one of these, especially Angels of America, I mean, huge amount of stories uh, on, on a year uh, of my life. But by the way, it was 183 day schedule, we came in at 182. <laughs> <laughs> We won 11 Emmys, and uh, the original budget was 20 million, we came in at 60. Which <laughs> 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 yeah. was, was for television back then was unheard of. Okay. Who were your other, you said there were three influences. Excuse me? You said there were three influences and went right to my family. Oh, I'm so sorry, because of time. Harold Ramis, of course, who I did Groundhog Day with, uh, who, and when I say influences, you know, you're, you're like a freelance uh, guy who gets on a ship. You don't know if the captain's crazy, if the crew's nuts, if you, if you get into it, we go out, you don't know how long the voyage is. Uh, and then you all come back and it disappears, and maybe you'll see one or two or three down the road uh, somewhere. Uh, these three people, Harold Ramis, uh, Penny Marshall, uh, for whom I did, did leave, and Mike, and Mike more than any, uh, became more than just people I worked for. <coughs> They really became the mentors and influencers of my life in a way that I can never clearly explain. Uh, outside of my mother, uh, of course, who told me the facts of life at 16 in 1958. And I want to pass this on to you. Uh, 1958, I, I, I was repulsed at the fact that my parents did something to bring me to the earth. Um, <laughs> and she told me, she said, come out in the kitchen, I want to tell you the facts of life. And I want to pass this on to you. Go out of the kitchen, underneath the cat clock with the tail. Just <laughs> got a cigarette and a cup of coffee. And worse when I'm sitting there. Never step on anybody to get what you want. Put back what you take out. And if you can put back more, put back more. Yeah. Thank you.